as we hear from God's word this morning, I invite you to open a Bible to Proverbs chapter 1, or you can follow along in the bulletin as we seek to hear God's word. We begin with prayer, and our first prayer this morning is for our own hearts and minds, that we would be receptive to God's word, and that the Holy Spirit would lead us in instruction and comfort as we follow Jesus together. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that they would hear God's word, be comforted by the gospel of Jesus and his love for them. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I would preach God's word faithfully and clearly so that much may be made of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. As we dive into God's word, you can open a Bible to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs is this wonderful book that is useful for learning about wisdom and how the world works and how God intends for things to work. But Proverbs is also a little bit of a confusing book. Book, we have trouble understanding it, or sometimes more so, we have trouble applying it, right? Because Proverbs feels like a collection of sayings. How many of you kind of that's your understanding of Proverbs? It's just a bunch of sayings put together. So, as you open a Bible to Proverbs chapter one, we begin over the next few weeks going through the book of Proverbs, studying what the Bible says about uh, God's wisdom for our lives and how we can have wisdom and live it out faithfully. I want to share with you a few of my favorite Proverbs that they're in the Bible, right? So we all agree they're good, yeah? They're in the Bible, they're God's Word, they're in Proverbs, so they must be wise, all right? But I'm going to share a few of them with you. Proverbs 25, verse 16 says this, do not eat too much honey or you will get sick from it and vomit, so there's a Bible verse for like every parent and grandparent in the history of the world where you can tell your kids and grandkids why they can't have more candy. It's in the Bible, right? Uh, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 18 and 19 says this, do not shoot flaming arrows into your neighbor's house or backyard and then tell them, I was only joking, which it's good. It's in the Bible. I would, it's probably you're going to be a better neighbor if you listen to it, but anybody ever been tempted Maybe don't raise your hands on that, (laughs) But it's there, all right? Again, in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11, one of my favorites, I tried to make it my confirmation verse, and they would not let me. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. It's great, because I grew up with dogs, always eating their own puke and all kinds of other disgusting things, right? Now, here's my point. Proverbs... Is wonderful. It's in your Bible. It, it is there for us to gain wisdom about God's word, about who God is, how we live as followers of God in this world. But at the same time, wisdom can be a difficult thing to understand and apply in our lives, right? Because I just read to you three Bible verses that are in Proverbs, the book of wisdom. And how many of you have memorized them, have applied them to your lives, like ever been at work or in a family conversation, be like, you know what would be really useful right now? Telling someone not to eat too much honey or they might get sick. That'll solve my problems, right? So what what do we do with Proverbs? What, What do we do with this thing that we call wisdom? And so what we wanna do over the coming weeks is dive into certain sections of the book of Proverbs so that we can, as God's people, gain wisdom from his word and learn to apply it not just to our own lives, but then we can share it and impart it to people in our lives so that they can follow Jesus better. So we're gonna begin in Proverbs chapter one, verse one, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Verse two says, for learning wisdom and discipline or instruction, for understanding insightful sayings or Receiving and having 
insight into sayings. So this is telling us, here's why this book was written. Here's why Solomon began to write this collection of teachings, is so that you and I can learn wisdom, we can have discipline in our lives, meaning we, we can learn how to apply it and put it into practice, and we're gonna talk about that in a little while, but then also so that we can have insight and understanding in how the world works, how God's world works and how we can live in it. So the word for insight, because Solomon's saying in verse two, here's why I'm writing these things. So you and I can learn wisdom and instruction, have insight into the way things work, is the Hebrew word binah, and it means to notice distinctions or differences that nobody else does. Right? And so what this means is that when there's a problem or there's a conflict or there's a difficulty, there's a decision to make in life, which I'm assuming all of us have run into those moments before, and we don't know which way to go, a lot of times, what do we do as humans? We kind of reduce it down to two things, right? We're like, it's either this, it's either A, or it's B, right? Or sometimes we feel so stuck, it's, this is all I can think of. There, there is no other option, there's no other way of doing it, there's no other decision to make, this is it, we're stuck with it. And biblical wisdom, that Proverbs, that Solomon wants to impart to us, that we can learn and grow in, is this idea of insight, benah, which means I, I can see other options that there, there's other choices, there's other ways of living and thinking in this scenario or this situation that I hadn't seen before, that others have not seen. Now here's the reality of it. Wisdom is incredibly practical for our lives. Right? If we get it right, if we understand God's wisdom and God's ways, it becomes incredibly practical for our lives because we are always faced with decisions, right? We're always faced with having to choose what to say or not say, what to do or not to do, where to go or not to go, all kinds of things that become so overwhelming for us. But wisdom and insight are about freeing us to realize sometimes there is another way that I haven't seen before. So here's another way that it becomes very practical we're gonna talk about as we go through God's word this morning. Anybody ever notice that as human beings we excel at dividing ourselves, right? We are so good about it's this way or it's this way, right? And what everybody over here says is what? I'm right and they're wrong, right? And then everybody over here conveniently says, no, I'm right and they're wrong. And we do this on numerous levels in all kinds of spheres of life, we divide ourselves and we think it's either this way or this way. You're either going down this path and it's right, or you're going down this path and it's wrong. And then the Bible says, well, if you actually have godly wisdom and insight from his word, you can actually look at the world and say, you know, there are differences, there are distinctions, there are other ways and choices in life to live and to think that you all aren't thinking of because we get so entrenched into thinking what? This is the right way and this is the wrong way and there's no other option. And I gotta tell you, from what I observe in the world, our world and our culture desperately needs people filled with godly wisdom, being able to speak into all kinds of different spheres and influences and circumstances and saying, did y'all know there's a different way? And in fact, because it's the Jesus way, there, there's often a better way. So this is insight. This is why Solomon is saying, here's what you and I can learn. Here's why I am writing these words to you, so that we can have insight, we can have wisdom, and that we can go into the world and tell the world, you know, we don't have to destroy each other. We don't have to constantly divide ourselves. There is a better, wiser way of living. All right, so now what we're gonna do, we're gonna jump all the way to verse 32. So, Here's why we're writing it. Here's what I want you to learn. There is wisdom, there is insight according to God's will, God's ways, God's word that is different than the world. Verse 32 says this, for the apostasy or the waywardness of the inexperienced or the naive will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. So there's two 
types of fools, two types of unwise people in Proverbs that Solomon is writing about in verse 32. One is the wayward, the apostasy, apostasy ones. Well, that's a hard word. All right. <laughs> right. They have gone off the path of God's ways. All right. That's what it means. They, they've, they've gone in their own direction. All right. And the word here in Hebrew is patim, and it means naive. It, it means someone that is lacking common sense. Anybody know anybody in your life that lacks common sense? Don't point them out. Just, you know, just laugh about it, right? right? We, we know people that it's just like, boy, you're re- you seem really smart and also kind of not so smart, right? right? This idea of lacking common sense, being naive to the ways of the world. Now, throughout the Old Testament, this is kind of the person, and it's usually referred to in context as a younger person, who is easily influenced by the crowd, which is why Solomon says they've gone wayward. They've gone away from the ways of God, essentially into the ways of the world. They're easily influenced, manipulated into the ways of the crowd. So for them, their definition and their foolishness of wisdom is everybody else is doing it, right? It'll make it easier, I will fit in, I won't have any conflict if I just go along with the crowd. Now, here's the deal. When I was a little kid, we got talked to about peer pressure all the time. Anybody ever get lectures on peer pressure and not, not give into it, right? And then, you, the, you know, the question my mom would ask, and I'm sure other moms have asked throughout the history of humanity is, Mark, if everybody else was doing it, would you jump off the bridge too? And I was a smart actor, like, well, how high is the bridge? And that's not what my mom wanted to hear. Just, that's growing in wisdom, right? But it's this idea, so we tend to go, oh, well, it's only for young people. I've met every adult in my life is tempted to give in to peer pressure, right, to follow the crowd, to go with what everybody's saying, right? At the very beginning, we think there's only like two choices, this crowd or that crowd. And we go, oh, well, this crowd is right because they're louder or they're bigger, and this must be the way to go. And Solomon's saying, yeah, but that's foolishness. You've gone wayward. You've gotten off the path of God's word and God's ways and God's wisdom. And then he says, the complacency of fools, so the word here for fools is kessel, and it literally means stupid. But we're in church, so we have to make it a nice word. So we say fools. But in this context, what it literally means is someone that always thinks they're right. Have you ever been around those pleasant people? They are always right. They're stubborn about it. Your refusal to admit you are wrong or change your ways or change your mind because guess what? I am right. Proverbs 14 says there is a way that seems right to a man. Right, that's this idea. So Solomon is saying this. There's two ways we act like fools as human beings. One is we listen to the crowd we listen to the culture, we listen to the world too much. And we go wayward from God's word and we follow whatever the trends are, right? The other way is we don't let anyone speak into our lives at all. So one hand, I listen way too much to the world and other people. On the other hand, since I'm always right, I'm never wrong, guess what you can't do? Tell me anything or change my mind. Anybody ever met someone so stubborn? They're like, they're just never gonna change their mind. Right, so this is our problem as human beings is what Solomon is saying. That we either act foolish by going wayward from God's ways and following the crowd and the trends and the pressure of society, or we go wayward from God's ways by being stubborn and thinking, I am always right, I am always wise, I am never wrong. Now, here's the hard part for us. We are all lacking wisdom as human beings. We are all foolish. We we all fall into one of these two categories where we think there is no other way. It's just we got to follow the crowd. We got to follow the noise. We got to follow the pressure. There's no other options, right? We're lacking insight. We can't see another way of living. Or we think the only way to live is 
my way, and no one else can correct for me. No one else can tell me otherwise. Now, here's the deal. We're all guilty of this, and here's my proof. Anybody ever made a decision in your life that you regret? Anybody ever made a choice in your life where you look back and go, why was I so dumb to think that was smart or wise to do? We know from our own lived out experiences, we are all lacking wisdom. We are all foolish in certain ways or in different times. And what we all need to do is listen to God's word, listen to what Proverbs and Solomon tell us, which is, here, I'm going to give you instruction so that you can be wise so that you and I can have insight into the way the world works, the way God has designed things, so we can tell the world there is a better way to live. It doesn't have to be this way or that way. It doesn't have to be your way or the highway. It doesn't have to be any of those things. We can say, no, there is a better way to live that God is inviting us to follow. All right, so we all need wisdom. We go back to verse two, for learning wisdom and discipline, for understanding insightful Sayings. Verse three, for receiving prudent instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity. All right, so he's telling us again, here's why I want you to read these. Because I'm going to teach you what wisdom is, and then he's gonna teach us how to put it into practice. All right, so the first step to learning wisdom is admitting that you and I actually need wisdom. I hate to burst your bubbles, but you don't actually know everything all the time. Just let that, we're just gonna sit in a moment of silence as you grieve. You don't know everything all the time. You are not wise all the time, and neither am I, which is why we have to admit that so we can go into God's word and learn what wisdom is. So a couple of things that he's telling us that we learn as part of the definition of wisdom. In verse two, he says, it's discipline. Right, the Hebrew word is musar, so it means discipline, instruction, a warning, right? So if you are the first kind of fool that you are going wayward from God's ways, guess what you need in order to be wise? You need discipline, you need correction or instruction, right? You need a warning that says you're going in the wrong direction. You're not living correctly. And what does Proverbs 32, verse 32 say? It doesn't just mean it's a simple mistake you'll get over. It says it will kill you. It will lead to your destruction. And so if that's where you're headed, part of wisdom is repentance, learning discipline and instruction and heeding God's warning of, I'm going in the wrong direction. And then it says prudence, right? Or sometimes it's translated as shrewdness or cleverness, right? Harma is the Hebrew word. And if you are the second type of fool who always thinks you are right, always thinks you are the smartest person in the room, guess what you need? You need some humility. You need to be shown there are people smarter than you. There is a being named God that is wiser and more clever than you are in the ways that the world works. So Solomon is saying, look, we are all fools at certain points in our lives. One way or the other, we are foolish in our behavior, in our thinking, in our living. And he's saying, but godly wisdom is the answer to both. It will either give us discipline and instruction on how to get back on the path that God intends for us, or it will humble us and help us realize, I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. All right, so as we talk about wisdom, one thing that I want to make clear, wisdom does include right and wrong, okay? Okay. Like, the idea of being a fool in Proverbs is you leave the ways of God. That would be sin, right? And so being wise means knowing the difference between right or wrong, following the ways of God. But wisdom, according to Proverbs in the Bible, is so much more than just what is right or wrong. Is it sinful? Right? I always get nervous as a pastor when someone comes up to me and goes, hey, pastor, is this sinful? Y'all have no idea how scared I am about what you're about to say to me, okay, in those moments. Because what we're looking for is what? I want permission for my foolishness, right? 
Is it right or wrong? Is it sinful or not, right? And the other way people bring it up is, show me the Bible verse that says I can't do it, right? That's when I know you're about to be a fool and go very, very wayward, all right? So there is an aspect to wisdom that involves morality, it involves right or wrong. Is it in line with God's word or is it not? But it's also so much more than that, right? It's also this idea of insight. Is there a different or a better or wiser way to live in life than what I imagine or what the world offers me? Right, so should I take job A or job B? Anybody ever been faced with that decision? Should I apply for this position or not apply for this position, right? Well, we need wisdom and insight for those things, but it's not necessarily a moral area. It's not a right or wrong. You're not sinning by taking one or the other, right? Whether it's to um, continue in a relationship or end the relationship, sometimes there's sin involved in that, and other times it's just, well, is it a wise relationship for your life, right? Where to live, what house to buy, where to move, what part of the city to live in. Well, those things are not sinful, right? They're not about right or wrong, but we do need insight into them. So this comes to us as understanding what wisdom really is. It includes all those things, right and wrong, making decisions, but ultimately it's about insight into how does God design things to work? And how can I live in line with God's ways and God's design for this world and my life, right? One of my favorite theologians uh, puts it this way to, in helping us understand uh, wisdom, right? So sometimes as Christians, we tend to think of it just as, is it sinful or not? That's part of it, but it's not all of it. So his example was this. Eating your lawnmower is not sinful, but it is dumb. That's a great understanding of what Proverbs is all about. It's not sinful to eat your lawnmower, right? You can do it. There's, there's not a Bible verse in here telling you not to. But it would be really, really dumb to do, right? Y'all get me? Right? And this is wisdom includes <laughs> more than just is it right or wrong, right? That's part of it. But it's more into I need insight into how God wants me to live as his follower in this world. Another thing about Proverbs is it's about learning how to apply that wisdom into our lives. So Proverbs 26, verses four through five says this. Don't answer a fool according to his foolishness or you'll be like him yourself, right? So don't engage in the conversation. Don't take the bait. Don't make the comments on Facebook and Instagram and everywhere else where it's all rage-inducing anyway, and it's how you get trapped into it, saying, don't engage with the foolishness, okay? Everybody would think that's pretty wise, right? That's good advice. Like, sometimes it's just better to not get involved into the argument or the debate. Here's the very next verse. Answer a fool according to his foolishness, or he'll become wise in his own eyes. Okay, so the first verse says, don't answer a fool according to his foolishness. The very next verse in Proverbs 26 says, answer a fool according to his foolishness. So here's the deal. If you're paying attention to me, what I just read is the opposite, right? One says, don't answer the fool. The next verse says, no, answer them, speak to them. And here's the point of wisdom. Both of these are true statements. There are times, right, when it is best, the most insightful decision, the wise decision is to what? Keep your mouth shut, <laughs> right? Don't make the comment, don't send the email or the text, just don't engage with the foolishness. And there are other times when what? The wisest, most insightful thing for you to do is to what? Open your mouth and speak God's word and wisdom to somebody and give them instruction and correction, right? So sometimes someone is so stubborn and so set in their ways, guess what? It's just gonna fall on deaf ears, right? And they're not gonna listen. It's a waste of time. And then other times people are acting so foolish, they're going wayward from God's path and you need to do what? Speak to them, give them instruction and wisdom and correction to bring them back into the ways of God. And this is ultimately what Proverbs is about. It's about giving you and me 
wisdom and instruction in how to apply God's word, God's wisdom to our lives and other people's lives. It's not always this black and white thing of, is this right or wrong? It's, is this wise or foolish? Is this insightful and helpful or is it not? All right, so if we go back to Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, probably one of the most famous Proverbs in all the book, says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. How many of you have heard that one before? All right. So when it, every Bible study, everything I've ever read about wisdom always includes that verse and then zero explanation. It's like, what's wisdom, pastor? And I just go, well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or knowledge. And then I just stop talking. How many of you be like, oh, that was helpful. Now I know how to make this choice later this week. Right, so what does Solomon mean by this? He's saying, okay, I want you to learn wisdom. And it can be tricky, right? Like Proverbs 26, verse four and five. When do I speak, when do I not speak? So he's saying, here's where you begin. You begin with this acknowledgement that I am foolish on my own and I need God's wisdom. And so here's where I begin. I begin with the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. So one of the things that Solomon is teaching us here, and we're gonna dive into this verse, is that wisdom is more than just strategies. How many of you like a good strategy or a good plan? Yeah, don't be shy, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, God had a whole plan of redemption mapped out for us, all right? So it's okay to have plans, right? But a lot of us, we get obsessed with, I need a strategy and I need a plan, I need steps, I need tactics, all of these things. And we think, if I can get those things, if I have a good plan or a good strategy, good responses, good tactics, then we'll go, that person is really smart. They are really wise. And Solomon says, actually, the beginning of wisdom is this, the fear of the Lord. There is no strategy there. There's no tactics. There's no plan. And this can be also very frustrating for us because we will spiritualize this tendency, right? Because sometimes we go, oh, yeah, that's the way of the world, and I'm a Christian. Yeah, well, you're also a human being who acts like a fool. I love you. Just let you know. Right? But we will spiritualize it, right? So people will come to me as a pastor and say, um, pastor, do you have any Bible verses for this? I am facing this situation. Now, it is good to seek God's word, right? We all agree with that. It's good to seek God's word. It is good to go to his word in times of trouble and need, seek his wisdom and guidance on things. But sometimes we do it because we think it's a quick fix. If I just get the right Bible verse, then what? It'll solve everything. I won't have this tough choice anymore or this thing or I'll do the right thing or I'll, right? It will be fixed. Sometimes it'll be, pastor, can you tell me how to pray about something, and I will talk to you about prayer. We did a whole sermon series on prayer. Prayer is incredibly important. Would you all agree, right? But sometimes we spiritualize this idea of if I just pray the right prayer, then I will get what? The answer that I'm looking for. I will get the strategy, I will get the tactic, I will get the plan that I'm looking for. And so it's very tempting to turn wisdom into thinking it's all about a strategy and a plan and tactics and things like that. And this is why it can be frustrating. Because how many of you excel at patience? How many of you excel at being impatient? Right? Everything in our world is dedicated to what? Making things go what? Faster, getting done quicker. And so Solomon is saying, I'm gonna teach you about wisdom. I'm gonna give you instruction in how to live insightfully and wisely in this life according to God's ways. How many of you would be excited about that if we said, I'm gonna put on a conference that's gonna teach you wisdom and help you make better decisions and better choices in life? By the way, these conferences sell out all the time, right, <laughs> in our world. Self-help and instructional things and all kinds of stuff like that, right? We'd be so pumped and then you would show up with the expectation of what? Don't lie to me, you're in church. You would show up with the expectation of, well, he better have some slides and you know, motivational content 
and he better give me some takeaways that are very practical, some strategies, some three-step stuff that I can put into my life and start applying right away. Now, don't lie. You're in church. He's watching. Let's be honest. That is our natural inclination as humans, right? That's what we want to call wisdom. Say, that's how I'm going to get it. That's what it's going to look like in my life. And you would all, and myself included, would be so disappointed when we showed up to Solomon's Proverbs Conference. Because he's like, here I am. I'm gonna teach you instruction and wisdom and insight for living in this world. And you're like, finally, I'm gonna learn it. And he goes, here's where we're gonna start. You're a fool. I'm like, that's not very nice. <laughs> Step two, the fear of the Lord. We'd all be going, where's the three-step thingy? Right? Where, where's the practical thing that I can apply on Tuesday? And here's why wisdom can be so difficult. Because it takes time. It takes living. It takes experience. It takes a time in having a relationship with God. It takes time in having a relationship with his word and praying and learning from him. Right? That's what verse 5 says. Let a wise person listen and increase in learning. So Solomon's already saying, there's already this wise person out there, and what's his instruction to the wise person? Keep listening, keep growing, and keep learning. Meaning what? You're, you're not going to get to the point where you're like, I'm wise, and I'm done now, right? You don't, get to walk, you don't get to put on your resume, wise man, okay? Like, and just like, oh, okay, great. You're done? Yep, learn it all. Right, even Solomon is saying, even when you get to that point of being wise, you gotta keep learning and keep hearing and keep growing, which means it takes time. But more than strategies and tactics and, and whatever we may do, here's what he's saying. Here's the beginning of knowledge and wisdom for your life. It begins with the fear of the Lord. Now, here's the difficulty with the word fear. Um, so many times when I was growing up, I, I struggled with this verse. I did not like this Bible verse. In fact, uh, I almost got kicked out of Sunday school because I didn't like this Bible verse so much. You know, they still ordained me, so that's their problem, all right? And yours now, all right? <laughs> but uh, um, my Sunday school teacher wanted to kick me out, and she almost quit, and that's not great. But I did not like this verse because what is it telling you to do? Fear who? The Lord. And there's like, that's it. That's all it means. That's all it says is fear the Lord. Right now, oftentimes we try to soften it of like, uh, you know, this or that or whatever. But I had difficulty of what, what do you mean I'm supposed to be afraid of God? Because doesn't Jesus love me? Anybody want to encourage me and say, yeah, he loves me? Thank you. He loves you too, right? But we're taught, Jesus loves me. And then he's telling me, saying, well, if you want wisdom in your life, you have to fear the Lord. What does that mean? The other thing that's difficult is this. The most common command in your whole Bible is, fear not, do not be afraid, because the Lord is with you. So what do we do with this? Well, there's two kinds of fears. One is the negative kind. If I have a distrust of somebody, if I don't believe they have love for me or good intentions for me, and I get into their presence, guess what I'm going to be? Afraid, right? I'm going to be afraid that they will hurt me, they will say something about me, or maybe you've gone to a meeting before and you're afraid that when we leave, they're going to gossip about you, say things about you, send emails or texts, or whatever it might be, right? There will be fear, there will be anxiety in our hearts because we have a distrust of the person. But there's also a joyful fear that's based on reverence. And it's not because I'm afraid that the person will hurt me, but it's because I care about and I love that person so much, I'm afraid of what? Hurting them, dishonoring them, disrespecting them. But it's a fear that's based out of I have a love for them and they have a love for me and I don't want to what? Mess it up. Right? And this is what it, our relationship with God is like. I love him so much, I, I want to honor him and desire to please him so much that I have this fear in his presence of wanting to be reverent and not wanting to harm or dishonor him. So example of this is when I proposed to my wife, Lauren. I knew she loved me because she had told me a whole bunch. And I was like, oh, okay, this might be okay to propose, all right? 
Um, her parents had given me permission. All right, and then I made a plan for how I was gonna do it. I was gonna take her to her favorite place in St. Louis, the Botanical Gardens. Her favorite area in the Botanical Gardens is a Japanese garden section. So I was listening, okay? This is the first step, right? And I take her there, and I have this whole plan. And she's having the best day of her life. And I am filled with more fear than I have ever experienced on a date in my whole life, all right? We're just walking around. She's like, look at this flower. I was like, who cares about the flowers? All right. And you're also trying to stay calm. And most guys that have proposed know what I'm talking about. You're like, just stay calm. Just stay calm, right? And we're going around. And the area that I wanted to propose in ended up being locked and gated. And I was trying to figure a way how to break the lock and jump over the gate. Because I was like, no, this is where it's happening. And then she just kept walking and walking and walking. I was like, where's she going? It's got to happen here, right? Now, eventually, we found another spot, and I got her to stop walking. <laughs> I was like, look, I'm trying to do something here. It's a surprise. You're going to love it, okay? Now, here's the deal. When I was growing up in school, I got in trouble every single day for talking too much and being disruptive to class. I know most of you can't imagine me being at a loss for words, all right? But in that moment... When I wanted to propose, and I got down on one knee and showed her the ring, in my head, I thought I said it as loud as I've ever said anything in the world. But what came out was, will you marry me? <laughs> now, luckily enough, it was loud enough for her to hear it, right? But here's why. Did I love her? Absolutely. Did I know she loved me? Yes. Did I know she was going to say yes? Was I filled with fear? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right? And so when Proverbs is talking about our fear of the Lord, it's not because I have a distrust of him and he's going to condemn me, he's going to judge me, he's going to destroy me, but it's because I have this such great love for him. I want to honor him. I want to obey him. I want to follow him. I want to live the way he wants me to live. And see, Solomon's saying, when you have that kind of relationship with God, where you trust him fully and you trust that he loves you, then you can learn to begin to be wise because then you will put your heart and your soul into his words. You will put your heart and your soul into following his ways in the world rather than the two foolish options which are my way or what the world says. You see what Solomon's getting at? It's not about strategies. It's not about tactics. Those things can be very helpful. And Proverbs does have advice to give to us on those things. But he's saying, if you really want to be wise in life, if you really want to grow in wisdom, you have to know who God is. And you have to know that he loves you and that he's not going to destroy you. He's not going to judge you. He's not going to condemn you. Instead, he's going to love you. Psalm 100 in 30, verse 4, you already have it memorized. It gets used in liturgy quite often. says this way. But with you, O Lord, there is forgiveness so that you may be feared. Why? Because I love him so much because I know how much he loves me. I know much he has forgiven me. And so out of gratefulness, I enter into his presence with reverence and better English word would be awe. Right, of who he is and how loving and amazing he is. So I want to please him with my life. I want to make his ways my ways. And so I'm saying, if you do that and you believe that about God and you know his forgiveness for you, you know his love for you, you will begin to be wise. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the apostle Paul says this, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Right? There's a very famous passage, and Paul is saying, here's the real rub of wisdom. The world says there's two ways. Be a fool by following the world, or be a fool by following yourself, always being right. And then Jesus comes along, God says, there is a different way. 
I'm gonna give you wisdom and insight. There's a better way to live, which is the way of Jesus, the way of the cross. And here's the deal. The world looks at the cross, looks at what God has done in Jesus and says, that is unwise. It is complete foolishness. Because in the cross, he gave up his right to judge and condemn you and tell you that you're wrong. And in the cross, he gave up all of his strength and became weak. And so when you and I want to be wise in the ways of God, and we believe in Jesus, we follow his ways, we follow his words, we know that his, he has great love for us, the crowd, the world, is gonna look at you and say, you are now foolish. So here's the deal. Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right or wise to a person, but it's the Lord that determines the path. So you and I have a choice when it comes to wisdom. We can either be wise in the eyes of the world and be praised for it and told, oh, you're so smart, you are such a great planner and such a great strategizer. Or we can be foolish in the eyes of the world but wise in the eyes of God because we're saying, I'm gonna live my life based on his ways and his word because of who Jesus is and what he has done for me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you have given to us instruction for wisdom and insight in how to live. We give thanks for your forgiveness. We give thanks for the foolishness of the cross because it is the beginning of wisdom for us that we are now able to follow you in this world. We are now able to come near to you because of your grace and mercy. We are able to hear and live out your word because of your Holy Spirit at work in us. Lord, may we repent of our foolishness in our own hearts and turn to your word for all of its wisdom and grace and mercy. In your name we pray.